I have been collecting items that would typically get thrown in the recycling bin or in the trash to repurpose them into beautiful home decor. This one, I'm using this CraftSmart polymer clay from Michaels. After working the clay and making it pliable, I'm using an extruder to create long spaghetti-like pieces. An extruder is not necessary to create this project. You can absolutely use your hands and roll the clay out like a snake. Next, I cut down the strings into four five inch long pieces and taking two pieces at a time, I twisted them in the direction away from me. You wanna make the twist pretty tight without breaking the clay. So using your hand, gently roll in opposite directions. This will make the twist tighter while slightly stretching it and making it longer. Then take the next two pieces and twist in the opposite direction going towards you. Now bring the two pieces together and again, gently squeeze them together. You don't wanna alter the shape since the clay is very warm at this point. Now I grab the tin can. This is a small size one, but you could use any size and place the clay onto the can. Each braid I created was enough for two rows on the can and I switched the direction. This helps with the illusion of a knit sweater look and repeat this covering the entire can with the braids. To cover the edges where the braids end, I rolled out a slightly thicker piece and wrapped one around the bottom and two around the top, and then stuck it in the oven at 275 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 minutes to harden the clay. After 15 minutes, I turn the oven off, but leave the piece inside to cool down gradually, and this helps with durability. Once it was cooled down, I painted the clay white. This did take several coats because I wanted all of the little gaps to be filled in, and that's it for this one. melted down a few Dollar Tree candles and saved the jars to create some cute little bud vases. First, I need to clean out the remaining wax residue and I used my heat gun to do that. This remelted the wax and allowed it to drip down to the bottom. And then I just wiped it out with a paper towel. The next candle jar upcycle is super easy. First, I gave this jar a coat of white gesso for a base. I'm gonna decoupage this one, and if you want the color of the napkin to stay vibrant, paint the surface white. I gave the jar two coats and then sanded it lightly to remove any brush strokes. Now, to add the napkin, I'm using my DIY liquid patina. I really love this decoupage medium for napkins. It dries quickly and somehow leaves less wrinkles. Like I said, the liquid patina dries pretty quickly, so you do wanna work in small sections. There are a few ways you can apply napkins for decoupage. I prefer to use my fingers to smooth it out. That way I can feel for any wrinkles. When I got around to the beginning, I made sure not to overlap the glue onto the napkin that was already laid down. Since napkins are so thin, you would be able to see that seam and anywhere that the napkins overlapped. But after the napkin was on, I set it aside to dry. Once it was completely dry, I cut the excess napkin off and then gently sanded. You wanna sand in a downward motion so you don't lift up that napkin. I was actually really surprised that I was able to sand the seam where the napkin edges meet. I thought for sure it would just rip the napkin I had already laid down right off. For a little detail, I grabbed some cotton twine and beads. I strung them up smallest to largest in the middle and then back to smallest. I did this two times so there were beads on each end of the twine and then I wrapped it around the top a few times. That's it for this one. Like I said, super easy. Picked up the last of my Quickcrete cement that was in this little bucket and cleaned it out. Then I took some pliers to remove that metal handle. 
I did have to wiggle it around a little bit before it got loose on one side, and then the second side just fell right out. I decided to cut the top portion of the bucket off that has those ridges on it. That part isn't necessary. I just wanted a cleaner look and to make it look less like a bucket. But you could also take some ribbon or rope or even fabric to cover that section if you choose to leave it on. I just used a utility knife and I had to make a few passes around the bucket before it cut all the way through. Next, I'm taking my hot glue to create dots all around the bucket. Again, you don't have to use hot glue here. You could use those dot stickers that the Dollar Tree sells or half wood beads to get a similar look. If you do use hot glue, I learned a few things during this process. You wanna make sure you hold the glue gun straight up and down. Don't tilt it at all because the glue will run and not keep a circular shape. And then because the bucket is slightly narrower at the top, when you lay it down, it's not level. So you want to put something under one end of the bucket to make it level and keep your hot glue from running and creating a disfigured circle. I let my trial first row of dots cool off and made my next row. I'm staggering the glue dots so I'll end up with a row of four dots, then a row of three, and so on. The second row turned out much better and since it's only hot glue, I was able to peel off the deformed ones to start over. I repeated this all the way around the bucket. It did take a little bit of time because I didn't want the glue to start running and had to wait a minute or two in between starting each new row. Once all the hot glue dots were dry, I took the bucket out to the garage to spray paint it. I want the main color to be this oil rub bronze, but since this was a bright yellow bucket, I didn't want to waste that color having to do several layers. So I first coated the bucket with a black primer. Then I only needed to add one coat of the oil rub bronze. I also sealed the bucket with a clear satin spray paint because the oil rub bronze was starting to scratch off easily. Next, I'm taking some of these wood rings from the Dollar Tree in two different sizes and hot gluing them onto the bottom of the bucket. I would have loved the rings to be all the same size, but I didn't have enough, and that's it for this bucket project. Project, I'm using two empty beer bottles. You can use any bottles that are shaped like this. I chose these ones because of the amber color. Of course, I need to start out by removing those labels. I prefer to use my heat gun to remove labels, but I know a lot of you like to use soapy water. I'm gonna do that method in a later project, but I will say that I still prefer this way. These bottles were a little bit more difficult though than usual. Typically the heat releases the glue super easily, but with these ones, I had to use my scraper to get the labels completely off. But once I got the labels off, I used my goof off to clean up any of the residue that was still on the bottles. Next, I'm taking some poster board to wrap around the top section of my bottles. I taped it in place using painter's tape and you wanna make sure that that shiny side of the poster board is on the inside against the bottle.
Next, I'm using some quick grease, and you might be able to figure out at this point what I'm making now. I've seen these beautiful half cement and half glass bud bases on Pinterest, and I had to recreate it. I mix up about a cup of cement with water. I'm not sure exactly how much water, I just like to add it until I have the right consistency. Typically, it will be like a pudding consistency. Then I poured it into the poster board form and I tried to be careful not to get any of that cement mixture into the beer bottle opening. That was a little bit difficult and some of it did drip down inside, which you can see in that final project. But I would pour some of the cement in, then tap the bottle against the table to level it out and get any trapped air bubbles out. And then I repeated that until the cement was right at the top of the bottle rim opening. And that one cup of dried cement ended up being the perfect amount. Since I used Quickcrete for this project, it doesn't take long for the cement to harden up. So about an hour later, I took the poster board off. I had a feeling there was going to be a line where that poster board started and there was. But since the cement is not fully cured at this point, I was able to just rub it down with my finger. I also took a sanding block to areas that needed smoothed out and that's it for this one. It was a super easy and inexpensive project to make to get that modern high-end bud base look. All right, for this one, I am still determined to figure out the rust effect using these metal paints. But again, I struggled to make this work. I'm not gonna make you sit through the whole process again, but I tried these Modern Masters one last time since I got the copper one to work in my thrift flip video a few weeks ago. Here's what the can is looking like after about two hours. And there is really no rusting on it, just that one little spot, which is just super frustrating. I think it's I think it's this paint because I had no issues with that copper one. Um, I'll pop a picture up of what the copper one turned out like. That one looked really good. It patinaed really great with the spray. So I think I think it's just this iron one. I don't know. Maybe it's more paint in here than the actual metal. I'm not sure what's going on with this one, but it's it's definitely specific to the iron. So I went out to the Dixie Bell retailer by me and I picked up their patina paints. So I wanna see like what the difference is and how much better this is going to work. So let me show you what I got. For the paint, I got both the iron and I got the bronze as well. I really love bronze right now in my home. So I'm really debating if I wanna go the bronze route or the iron route because I already have the iron paint on here and that was what I was starting with. I don't know, we'll see. And then I also picked up, so they have two different types of patina sprays. There's a blue spray and then there's a green spray. Depending on like what kind of result you're looking for is which one you would use. So the blue says that it's for bronze and copper. The green says it's for bronze, copper, and iron. But then the girl at the store um, who owns the, the booth there, she told me to look down at the, I'll get a close up of this too, of at this little like image down here to see what the result is going to be. So you can see they're a little bit different for the blue and the green. So we're gonna do a little bit of experimenting to see how much better the Dixie Belle one is, first of all, because it's gotta be better than, than this mas modern masters one, which I'm still uh, I'm pretty disappointed about because that stuff was not cheap at all. You have to use the primer. I didn't pick up the Dixie Belle primer just because it's the exact same thing that this primer is. All this does is it blocks the like acidity in these patina sprays from going like literally eating through the metal. So this is like the base layer that's going to stop it from continuing to just eat away at the piece. Let's open these things up and see if we can get a better result than this uh, just tiny little piece of not even what looks like rust. I ended up going with the iron to start and applied it the exact same way. So I'm gonna shake this up really well again and we're going to add the second coat. I'm actually gonna try something a little different. I'm not gonna put it on the entire thing. I'm gonna put it in intentional spots of where I want the rust to be. And then 
I'm also gonna, I was just watching a few videos on other people using this stuff. And then I'm gonna take the green spray because this is the only one that will work on the iron. The blue spray will not work, it doesn't activate at all. But I'm gonna put the patina spray into a little souffle cup. I don't wanna actually spray it on because I don't actually like that look when it's like drippy. I want it to be more stippled on. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use some chippy brushes to stipple it on. And then once we do that, I'm gonna try and take some of the bronze paint then and get the bronze patina, the like green to also come out in some like select little areas. So we're gonna experiment. We're gonna see how this one turns out because I really love this stuff. I think it's such a cool idea and there's so much you can do with it. So I'd love to, figure out how it actually works. I should have stopped here, but of course I kept going. I was trying to get in some of those lighter colors in here. And this is what it's looking like after a while, a hot mess. To try and save it, I took the bronze paint again and went over the entire can. To my surprise, when I came back a few hours later, for some reason, the areas with the original rust effect were showing through and actually gave that authentic look I was trying to create this whole time. Funny how things can work out like that sometimes. I have no idea why it did this. The last thing I wanted to do was add a raised stencil. And to do that, I used Dixie Bell Mud, but spackle or joint compound works just as well in a palette knife to spread it on. Once the mud dried, I gave it a quick sand. The patina did bleed through, but I left it as is so it didn't look too new. And that was it for this one. Such a process to get here, but I'm glad I didn't give up. For this project, I'm using one of these cylinder concrete forms. Now, I know this isn't exactly trash, but I've had it laying around in my garage for my plaster table DIY. You could also use a bucket or other cylindrical object to create the same thing. I cut the form down into two sections at different heights. And I'm going to wrap the cylinders with these tile sheets that I picked up off the side of the road. Someone was just throwing them away. This is a pretty easy project. You just need some liquid nails to stick the tile sheets on. I put on a pretty healthy amount so that they stick well, and then you pretty much just have to plop it right down on the cylinder. You do wanna make sure to press the tiles down well so that they adhere. The large cylinder I had to cover with a little bit more than two sheets, and the paper backing makes it easy to just cut them down. I wasn't able to fully cover either one with the tiles. There was a gap that wouldn't fit another tile, and I didn't want to cut the tiles themselves down, so I left it. We'll fill that in in the next step. I let the liquid nails set up and dry, so next I need to fill in all the gaps with grout. I would have loved to do a contrasting grout color, maybe black or something dark, but I already had the snow white color on hand for my kitchen makeover. So I decided to just use this instead of spending more money. You can buy pre-mixed grout, but I didn't have that, so I needed to mix it myself. All you do is add water. I added way too much at first, forgetting you only need a small amount, so I strained a lot of it out. But once it was mixed to a thick paste, I let it sit for three minutes to absorb that water. Typically you wanna add grout with a grout float, but I couldn't find where mine was, so instead I used a putty knife and that worked just as well. You also wanna work in sections. Since a lot of the grout gets onto the tiles, you don't wanna let it sit there and dry out for too long. So I took a wet sponge and I wiped down the tiles to remove any of that excess grout. And this also smooths out those grout lines. When I got to those large gaps, I just filled them in with the grout. I'll make sure that this part is the back and you hardly even notice it. Mm -hmm. 
I thought about adding a painted design to the tiles or some sort of artwork, but I couldn't decide what exactly to do. So I left them unpainted for now, but let me know in the comments if you have any ideas on what I should put on them. I think I'll incorporate that into a future video. I did paint the insides of the forms white so it didn't stick out like a sore thumb and that's it for this one. grabbed my polymer clay and rolled it out, not paying much attention to the shape of it. I just wanna make sure that it's thick enough to hold its shape. Then I cut it down into a thin strip and applied it to the side of the glass jar. I've been seeing a few pottery designs like this on my Pinterest feed lately and wanted to give it a shot. The clay sticks pretty well to the glass on its own. I do go back and add some glue here in a little bit, but I wanted to get all the pieces on first. I pinched the outer edge of the clay all the way down to start creating that ripple look. Once I got all the pieces on, I'm taking this Sculpey oven bake adhesive and added it all along the edge of each clay strip. Not too much, just enough to make sure it stays on the glass. And I kind of wiggled the clay a little bit to make sure the glue got underneath of it. Then I put the jar into the oven at 275 degrees Fahrenheit for about 30 minutes. Then you want to turn the oven off and let it gradually cool down inside. The next day, once the glass was cooled off, I painted everything in this sandy blonde color by DIY Paint and gave it three coats. When painting glass, you wanna let each coat fully dry before adding that next coat. Otherwise, you'll lift up some of that previous paint layer. Now I was debating if I wanted to leave it this solid color or add some white wax to it and I landed on adding the white wax. I always scoop out a little bit of the wax onto a popsicle stick, that way my brush doesn't contaminate it or get any of that colored paint into the wax. I added the white wax to a few sections and then wiped it off with a dry paper towel. Let me know in the comments which version did you prefer, the solid tan or with the white wax? I really like how it looks with the wax. I'm using paper towel rolls to make some Christmas candles. At first I was only gonna have a set of three candles, but then decided to add four more. So you're only gonna see three here at first. But I'm cutting them down to be varying heights and no two candles are gonna be the same height. Now you could leave the rolls just like this and paint them, but I of course wanted to take it a step further and give them some texture while disguising the fact that they're paper towel rolls a little bit better. So I'm taking some joint compound and covering the entire surface of the rolls. Once they were dry, I'm using a 220 grit sandpaper to smooth them out. There is still gonna be some divots left in the joint compound and that's okay. I didn't want them to be completely smooth. I love the way these are starting to turn out with that texture.
Next, I need to add in the tea lights. I have these ones from when I made a similar project using pool noodles last Halloween, but I had painted them black. So I now need to make them white again, and I taped off the candle flame so I don't get paint on that part, and then painted all the tea lights. The tea lights are just a little bit smaller than the opening of the paper towel rolls, so I stuffed some paper down inside of the tubes so that the light can rest on it, and then I was able to glue them in. Now, to make them look even more like melting candles, we of course need to add in the dripping wax. I'm using hot glue and just adding globs of it so that it starts to drip down the sides. This does use a lot of hot glue sticks. I think I used four or five of the longer ones. On the smaller candles, I added a few layers of the hot glue since they would have melted a lot more than the candles that are still tall. This footage is so satisfying to watch sped up. For the rest of the display, you could use either a rectangular tray, which I'm showing here. I thought I was gonna go this route, but once I saw the candles on the circular tray, I decided I like this one better. But before I decorate the tray, I still need to paint the candles. I'm using that same off-white paint that I used for the tea lights and gave all the candles two coats. I had painted the tray black once before, but I wanted a more metallic look for this project. You really don't see the tray in the end, so this isn't necessary, but I spray painted it burnished amber. Now I can remove the tape from the flames, and at this point I had a moment of panic. I was gonna hot glue them down onto the tray, but then I had realized I would not be able to turn them on and off. I also have that paper inside of them, which makes it a little bit more annoying. But I'm glad I had thought not to glue them down in place before it was too late. It's still gonna be a little bit annoying to pull them out of the display every time I wanna turn the lights on though. It's time to decorate and make this arrangement look pretty. I picked up some floral picks from Michael's and I laid them out around the base of the candles. I love to have a variety of picks in my displays using different colors. I used a few different styles of pine with different tones of green, but they are all flocked to tie everything together and make it look cohesive. I also added in some little lamb's ear berry picks and non-flocked pine, and I think this turned out so beautiful. another bucket idea, this time using a large five gallon paint bucket from the paint I used on my deck. I'm gonna take some pool noodles and cut them down to fit around the outside of the bucket. Then I cut the pool noodles in half to make them thinner and less bulky for when we add them onto the bucket. Now because the top of the bucket has those ridges and the lip that sticks out further from the bottom, I needed to add something to the bottom to make them the same depth. I took apart this old Scandinavian style light fixture that I made a few years ago and used the rows of Jenga blocks as spacers around the bucket. Next, I can add on the pole noodles, and I started at the top because I wanted to make sure the lid would still fit back on. I also thought it would look better to make sure that there was a full pole noodle at the top and it wouldn't need to be cut down at all. You wanna be careful when using hot glue on a pole noodle, it will melt right through that material. So I would add a job of hot glue and then hold the pole noodle in place until the glue cooled down. That way it wouldn't start to pull away from the bucket. And I didn't add glue onto every inch where the pole noodle touched the bucket, only every so often to hold its shape. Once you get to the end, if your pole noodle's too long, it is easy to just cut off the excess. 
I had to do that most of the time, but I'd rather have the noodles too long than too short. At the bottom, there was a gap and it wasn't big enough to fit another pool noodle. I didn't wanna cut one down either. I thought that would look silly. So instead, I cut down some poster board to create about a one inch solid section at the bottom. Next, I'm gonna cover the pole noodles with fabric. So I got out my flexible tape measure to figure out the length of the fabric that I need. I did make sure to tuck the tape measure in between each pole noodle so I could account for the fabric that would be tucked in as well. I'm gonna start the fabric where the pull noodles meet so that all the seams are on the back side. Then I'm taking my hot glue to apply the fabric to the bottom part of the bucket where the poster board is. I applied the hot glue and then it kind of tucked the fabric up underneath of the bottom pull noodle. That way it has a nice clean finish along the bottom. Now, in order to see the fluted sides or the ridges that the pole noodles create, I'm taking embroidery floss and tying it really tight around the fabric. It's tucked in between the noodles and you cannot see it from the outside. And again, I tied the knot on the back side just to make sure all those messy bits are contained in one area. At the top of the bucket, I hot glued the fabric down around the rim and then I cut off any of the excess. I was still figuring out what I wanted to do as the top, so next I decided to paint the poster board black. And I'm using my black 3.0, which is marketed as the blackest black in the world. It has a very unique texture to it and almost feels velvety. I did a whole comparison of this project in a Halloween video last year that I'll link in the description box, but I put two coats of this paint on the poster board. I figured out what I wanted to do with the top. I've had this wood round lying around from an old project and it's the perfect size to make this a little ottoman side table. I didn't wanna just paint the wood round, so instead I got out my Dollar Tree faux leather fabric. Now the one downside to using the Dollar Tree faux leather is that it isn't quite wide enough to cover the wood round. I had to use two sheets so you can see a seam on the top of the table. It really didn't bother me, but you could always use a larger fabric piece or even just paint it. I measured out two inches from the edge of the wood round onto the back of the fabric. This will be enough to cover the sides and staple it down underneath. I wanted to make sure where the seams meet was nice and tight on the wood round since I can't just tug at the fabric from both sides. So I got out my Mod Podge and I glued the fabric down. I paid close attention to where the two fabric pieces meet to try and get it as seamless as possible but you can definitely still see it. I let the Mod Podge dry and then started to secure the fabric down to the back. I wasn't thinking at first and started using hot glue. That was a terrible idea, but I'm glad that I didn't get too far before I realized the staple gun would work much better. When stapling fabric onto a round surface, you wanna pick a point to start at. I started where the two fabric pieces meet, then you wanna take it section by section. Don't just go around the circle. You wanna pick another point, maybe a few inches down and staple that. From there, you wanna pull at the fabric in the middle of your two stapled points and secure that down. Then work your way in towards your starting points. I hope that makes sense, but this will give you a seamless, smooth look from the front without any puckering on the edges. 
Just keep tugging and pulling at the fabric, working it to be smooth and secure it with a staple. And if the staple doesn't go all the way in, which happens sometimes, just take a hammer and pound it in. And that's it for this one. I left the inside of the bucket plain, but you could line it with fabric or paint to finish it a little bit more. I love how this turned out and you would never guess it started out as a five gallon paint bucket. This is the one I've been seeing all over the internet and of course in farmhouse style, but we aren't going that direction on this channel. To start, you wanna remove the bottom of the tin can. I have a can opener that doesn't leave sharp edges, but if you don't have one like this, make sure you file the metal down so you don't cut yourself. It is very sharp. If you want to add a hanger, I would suggest adding in the holes at this stage before closing up the bottom because we're making a floral pocket. I used my crocodile to add a hole on each side. Next, I need to close up the bottom and started squeezing the can at the bottom together. I thought this was gonna be a little more difficult, but it really wasn't too bad. If you have a vise, you could use that to easily crush the bottom in. I didn't find this to flatten the can any more than I had with my hands, but a hammer would work as well. I also squeezed the top in slightly to create a more oval shape, and then I painted the can in sandcastle. Next, I took this silk screen stencil and applied it to the top and bottoms where the can is flat to give a more bohemian style to this floral pocket. I also took the white paint over the ridges of the can. I wanted this section to look a little more worn, so I added sandcastle back over top on the high points. Now I can add the hanger using four millimeter macrame cord and decorate with florals. I love this take on the floral pocket, but let me know what you think. For this project, I'm using an empty wine bottle. I love how you can see the layers of stained glass from how long it took us to drink this, but I'm painting the whole bottle white and it's going to get covered up. I gave the bottle two coats and painted in a crosshatch motion. So the first coat of paint, I used horizontal brush strokes, and the second coat I did vertical. This just helps provide more coverage. Typically with white, I end up needing three coats, so this helped. I'm turning this into a little snowman, so once the paint was dry, I just grabbed a little piece of fabric to see where the hat's gonna sit. I made a mark there so I know where to start the face on him. Next, I drew on his face with pencil and then I outlined it with a micron pen before going in with my paints. I'm gonna let the painting part play so you can see how I did everything, but feel free to skip forward if you aren't interested in seeing this part. On the nose, I blended a few colors of paint to try and get a more realistic but still painterly look. I used orange, brown, and white for this.
After I painted his face on, I'm gonna add a hat. I had this vintage looking striped fabric in my stash and I cut a piece down to wrap around the bottle. At the top of the hat, I bunched the fabric together and then I used a strip of the fabric to tie around it. Then I tucked the excess fabric inside the bottle opening. I wanted the top to look like a palm, so I glued some of these large pom-poms that I have around the top of the bottle. And that's it for this guy, he is so adorable. Next I'm creating a textured look using paper towels and tissues. I poured some school glue in a bowl and watered it down. I would say it ended up being a one-to-one -one ratio of glue and water. And then I ripped up strips of paper towel. You want to make sure there are no straight edges on the paper towel. It will blend together better this way. And then I dipped each strip in the glue, wrung it out, and added it to the can. While adding the paper towel, I wanted it to have bunched up sections and not be flat. I let this layer dry and then added a second layer with the same process. After the second layer was dry, I started to paint, but I could really see the texture of the paper towel, like those little holes in it, and I didn't want that look, so I grabbed some tissues and laid those down right on top of the dried paper towel then took a paintbrush with that glue mixture and pat the tissues down. And I added two layers of the tissue to get a smoother look. Once the tissues were dried, I took the color Mud Puddle by Dixie Belle and painted the whole can. Let that dry and then with a chippy brush, I added Sandcastle, giving it a heavy dry brush look. The last color I added is white, doing that same heavy dry brush technique, and that's it for this one. I love how it has that faux stone type of look, and it was so easy to create. I am so excited to share this next one with you guys. When I did my deck makeover, I bought a bunch of flowers, and they always come in those little plastic containers. I was determined to come up with a project to reuse those rather than throw them away. I'm gonna turn these into pillar candle holders, so I first glued two of the containers together with the bottoms against each other. Now, you'll see I only have three containers here, but I ended up using five in total, so the two that I just glued together will be the shorter of the two. Then I painted the containers a light medium tan color called Sandy Blonde by DIY Paint. I scoured my craft room trying to figure out what to do with these and nothing was quite making sense or it wasn't gonna turn out right. Then finally I saw these Dollar Tree hats that I bought last year and this was perfect. You can easily take these hats apart by snipping the thread where it ends on the brim, then simply pull the ribbon until the hat comes apart. Once you have the hat pulled apart into one long ribbon, there's also an invisible thread running through the whole thing. You also wanna pull this out. I ended up using one hat for this project and I still had a little bit of the ribbon left over. Now I'm gonna start wrapping the ribbon around the containers. I didn't want it to have a spiral look, although that probably would have made it look cleaner around all four sides. But instead I wanted it to have rows of the ribbon. So I glued it down and I would cut the end of each row before starting the next one. Each row that I added, I slightly overlapped the one below it. That helped the ribbon form to the tapered shape of the containers. And that's why I struggled so much figuring out what to cover these with because the shape tapers in and then back out. So you can't just wrap it with something solid. This worked out perfectly and it covered up the space where those two containers meet.
On the second pillar, I added one more container on top, and this time the two openings facing each other. This section was a little bit more challenging to add the ribbon because it didn't want to stay straight, but it worked out and they look so good. For the top and the bottom of the candle holders, I'm using these wood squares from Hobby Lobby, and I have two different sizes. I sanded them down because the edges are pretty rough, and it's a little hard to tell in this clip, but the one on the left has not been sanded yet. Then I wanted to do some stain testing. I've never used a pre-stain and decided to test it out on the bottom of the base piece. The top half of it has pre-stain and the bottom does not. You can see it really does make a difference in how evenly the stain is applied. I also have two different color stains on here. The left side is natural, which just enhances the natural color of the wood, and then the right side is a very light coat of golden oak. I wanted to keep this piece light and decided on the natural using the pre-stain underneath. As soon as I laid all the wood pieces out together, I could tell they were made from two different types of wood. I really loved the tone of those larger ones and the smaller ones looked a lot more yellow, which I didn't love. So I coated all of them with the pre-stain and then I thought I might be able to match the tone of the smaller ones to the bigger one. I first added that natural stain and then a tiny little dab of the golden oak for a wash mixed in with the natural. That wasn't working and I played around with other stain colors, but I was just making it look worse. So I abandoned that and just used the natural like I originally planned. I let the stain dry overnight and then I glued two of the smaller wood pieces together. This is gonna be the top, so I wanted it to be a little bit more chunky looking. You just wanna make sure that the wood grain is facing the same direction when you glue them together. Next, I hot glued the containers down to the wood pieces. The larger one is on the bottom and then the two smaller ones on top. Again, make sure that the wood grain is going in the same direction. And that's it for this guy. I love how they turned out and you would never know they were made from plastic nursery pots. For this trash to treasure project, I'm taking an empty breadcrumb container. This one was an eight ounce container for reference, and of course I removed the label. This one peels off pretty easy, and you don't need to worry about getting every last little bit off because it's gonna get covered. The second material we need for this project is cardboard. I'm using a good old Walmart box, but any cardboard will work. You just wanna open it so that it lays flat. I made sure that my breadcrumb container would fit lengthwise in one of the panels of the box, and it did. So I cut the box down along all of those scored sections using a box cutter. Next, I drew a line at the top of my container so I know how tall it is in comparison to the cardboard pieces. Then I drew a wavy kind of shape that would be the same height as the container. Once I cut out this first wave piece, I thought it had turned out a little bit too wide. I'm gonna be making a wavy, fluted type of vase and I wanted it to be a little bit less wide and round. So I redrew the shape and cut it down again. 
This one looks much better. So I'm gonna use this as my template to trace and cut out 19 more to have 20 curved cardboard pieces in total. And you wanna make sure you're tracing that same piece the whole time. I wrote template on my first piece so I knew which one to keep using. Otherwise you could end up making each piece slightly wider and wider each time without even realizing it. Next, I'm gonna hot glue each of the cardboard waves all around the breadcrumb container. I glued two on opposite sides down first and then two more in the middle on each side as well. I tried my best to get the spacing as even as I could and I even used my flexible tape measure to make sure that they were all spaced out the same, but in the end you can see that some are slightly further apart than others. You're gonna see here how it's starting to take its shape now. Now to make this come to life and not look like cardboard, I'm using my instant paper mache to start filling in each of the sections. You can find this at any local craft store or on Amazon. I do have it linked in my description box, but if you don't have instant paper mache and you wanna make a similar project, you can use toilet paper, school glue, flour, and salt. And I can leave this recipe in my description box for you as well. This pre-mixed bag has all of the ingredients in it and you just need to add the water until you achieve your desired consistency. I like it to be a little bit thinner, which makes it easier to work with in my opinion, but you can also make it a little bit thicker to be more like clay if you wish. It just depends on what you're trying to do with it. For this first layer of paper mache, I pretty much just want it to be a skim coat. I just wanted to cover up all of the cardboard at this point and didn't worry about shaping it to look like the vase that I was envisioning. Here's how it's looking after one layer of the paper mache, so I let it dry overnight. For the next layer of paper mache, I'm gonna start to fill in the space between each cardboard section. I didn't fill it in all the way though, I wanted to be able to see the ridges all the way around the vase. So I filled it in kind of a U shape if that makes sense. So you have your ridge and then it dips down a little bit and then back up to the next ridge. Then I dip my finger in water and I smoothed out the section so it doesn't dry super rough and jaggedy and then I let this dry again overnight. Next, I'm gonna paint the whole thing white. Now, I know the paper mache is white already, but you could still see that cardboard in spots, so I wanna make sure that it's covered up and the whole thing is one solid color. And these pointed style paint brushes are perfect for something like this to get into all of the cracks and crevices. You could stop here and put a plant in it. I think it is stunning just like this, but you know I had to take it one step further. So I got out my rub and buff in the color gold leaf and I applied this to the tip of all the ridges. I started out using my finger, but as you can see, it wasn't getting a solid gold look because paper mache is uneven. So I got out the makeup brush that I like to use with rub and buff and this worked out so much better to get an even gold finish. I also added the gold around the breadcrumb rim and that's it for this project. But before we get to the reveal, I do wanna let you know that Rub and Buff is not as easy to clean off as a paintbrush using soap and water. This is more oil-based and requires paint thinner or something similar to clean it. So I try and remember to clean mine as soon as I'm done using them in order to not ruin my brushes. So anyways, let me know in the comments, did you like this face solid white or with that gold accent better?
I think this is my favorite from today. I'm taking this same polymer clay and rolling it out into a thin strand. I'm gonna start shaping the clay into a face. I love those line art faces I've seen on vases and artwork and thought this would be perfect for adding to the tin can. However, getting the face onto the can was a little bit difficult. I think because I was using one of the small cans so there wasn't much room to work with, it just took me some patience, but eventually I got it. Once I got the face on, I'm taking this liquid Sculpey, which is liquid clay that acts like a glue. This will bond my clay pieces to the tin can while it bakes in the oven. You could also bake the pieces and then glue them on afterwards. Next, I'm taking this stone spray paint in bleached stone and sprayed it over the entire can. This stuff works best if you pulse spray it rather than hold down the nozzle for a continuous spray. And that's it for this one. Up is another bucket project. My son wanted to make a knuckle sandwich for his uncle and we made it with one of those plaster hand mold kits. So of course I had to keep the bucket. I cut the top off of this one and I'm sure you can guess what we're making here. Yep, another planter. This one is going to be different though, don't worry. I wanted it to be raised off of the ground or off of the table or wherever it's gonna live. And I had these scrap MDF one by two pieces. So I cut them down to be six inches and I made three of them. I'm gonna set those aside for now and peel off the label from this bucket. Thank goodness this one actually came off super easy. I'm gonna give this a grass cloth look. I've done this before on my channel and I've been wanting to do it again. This is an easy technique and very forgiving. The key ingredient is having that Liquitex or some sort of glazing medium. This prevents your paint from drying too quickly so you have some time to work with it. I'm using a nylon brush here, but I'm gonna also show you some other objects that you can use as well. Also, I'm gonna apologize now, I'm partly out of frame during this process. That's also why I wanted to show you other objects so I could refilm that part. I don't have an exact ratio on how much glazing medium to paint you should use. I did approximately a one-to-one -one ratio, but I also mixed up way too much here. I only needed a really small amount. This stuff goes far. Before you start, you wanna make sure that your bucket or vase or whatever you're using has the base color that you want to show through. In this case, I wanted the base to be white, so I left the bucket as is and just started to paint with my colored glaze. And the paint doesn't need to look pretty here, just slap it on. The last time I did this, I learned that if you go in sections, you end up seeing those seam lines where you stop and start. So this time I decided to paint the whole thing at once. It's also a much smaller planter this time than what I had done before. after you get the paint on, you wanna take your brush and comb over the surface. This is gonna add lines and texture to your planner and I started out going horizontal. Then I do the same thing going vertical. This starts to create that grass cloth look. And you can keep going over it until you like how it looks or the paint starts to dry. But since we added that glazing medium, you have some time to play around. After I did the vertical lines, I went horizontal again, and I liked how those lines were a little bit more prominent. Like I said, you can use other objects besides the nylon brush. Here I use one of those little twig brooms that the Dollar Tree sells in the fall. I 
also used this little dust brush I found at my local hardware store. This one gave a much more subtle look, but still pretty. I think it just depends on what you have to use on hand and how much texture you want. Back to the project at hand, I let the paint completely dry, and then I'm taking this fabric roll from the Dollar Tree and I'm gonna use it to line the inside. I glued it so that the edge of the fabric was a tiny bit on the outside and let the fabric drape down on the inside. Next, I'm adding this little pom-pom ribbon all around the rim. I did two rows. So the first one is where the fabric seam meets the bucket, and then the second one right above that. Now that the bucket portion is done, we can add on those legs. There are plenty of ways that you can do this. I wanted to have more of an industrial boho type of vibe, if that's even a thing. So I got these hex bolts that I'm gonna use. I drilled two holes in each leg for the bolts and then it was a little bit difficult to get the hole started on the bucket because it's a slick surface. So I used a screw to start it and then my drill bit to make it wider. Then I was able to add the bolts and screw the nut on on the inside. And that's it for this one. Project, I'm using an empty fabric softener container. I started to remove the label and this thing was really stuck on there. It did not want to come off without a fight. I had to heat it up with my heat gun and then scrape it off a bit by bit. Next, I took my hot knife and cut off the spout of the container. This plastic is super thin. You could even cut through it with an X-Acto knife. I'm gonna add paper mache to the outside and since this is a slick surface, I thought I would give it a scuff sand. That's probably not necessary, but it also doesn't hurt. And now we can get out the paper mache. This is an instant paper mache and I love working with it. It's called Celluclay and all you have to do is add water. My camera battery died and I didn't notice that. I'm sure someone will have something to say about it in the comments, but anyways, you'll see I have part of the container covered already. I continued to add the paper mache by just scooping it out of the bowl with a spatula and spreading it over the surface. I did have to mix up another batch of the paper mache, so here you can see it's just the celluclay powder 
Add some water and mix it until you have a paste. I just add water a little bit at a time. Once the whole thing was covered, I let it dry. I only put a thin layer on to start and I didn't love how you could still see all of those raised corners of the container still. I thought it looked too much like its original object. So I added another layer to build it up in some spots. had to let the paper mache dry again and then it was time to paint. You could just leave this unpainted as well. I love that look. The last paper mache project that I did, I left unpainted and it's stunning. But I started off painting with the color sandstone, which is a very light and neutral tan. I wanted to make the vase look aged, but with layers. So next I got out my dark wax. I only added this in select spots where a vase would naturally age. Areas like the handle that would get picked up a lot with the oils from your hands and the bottoms where it gets set down. I added the dark wax and then I wiped it off with a baby wipe. Making something look aged is always a struggle for me. You have to trust the process and I always think that it starts out looking terrible, but I kept going. Next, I used my white wax over top of the dark wax to turn it to tone it down. I was starting to think the vase was just looking dirty now and not in a good way. It doesn't come across as well on camera, but it wasn't looking good. So I'm taking another light tan paint color and this time I'm using a sponge dauber. I'm gonna just glide the paint over the textured surface so that it doesn't fill in the entire area. I think this adds a more authentic aged look than the wax did, especially on this particular type of surface texture. Now I love the way that this one turned out. next one is a little bit more involved. I had this empty protein container that I'm turning into, you guessed it, another vase. I wanted to add some sort of pipe design to the outside of the container. Again, this is something I've been seeing on my Pinterest feed and wanted to give it a shot. I found these piping bags and piping tips at the Dollar Tree, and this is the perfect project to test them out. So I grabbed my spackle and you can tell by its barely pink color that it's pretty dried out. So I added some water to try and revive it. This didn't work out that well, but I kept going and put the spackle into a piping bag. I used the petal tip, which is this half moon looking one and just went for it. That was problem number two. I didn't have a plan as to what design I was creating. 
I thought I was gonna do a little staggered teardrop shape all the way around the top portion, but since the spackle was half dried out, it kept clumping up and clogging the tip. The whole thing started to look really sloppy. So I wiped off all that spackle with a spatula and set it aside while I came up with a plan. I wanted this vase to look more homemade and like pottery and the rim was not helping to achieve that look. So I got out my hot knife and melted that top rim off. Then I used the flat surface of the knife to melt down any of those rough edges. Then I took what was left of my half dried out spackle and smeared it all over the container. I used my hand to do this, which probably wasn't the smartest option, but since it was drying out, I figured this was probably the easiest. Then I set it aside to dry. Once it was dry, I came in with sandpaper to smooth out any of those super rough areas. At this point, I was really doubting if this project was gonna turn out decent at all. There was just way too many ridges on this. It wasn't going to work to add a design on top. So I bought some joint compound, which I prefer over spackle on a project like this anyways, and I spread it over the whole surface again. This time I used a trowel to try and get a smoother result. Again, once it dried, I sanded it down, and for some reason, as the joint compound was drying, it formed a bunch of little air bubble pockets, and you can see a bunch of tiny little pinholes all along the surface. So I added one last layer of joint compound to fill in those holes. Finally, it is looking how I wanted. Not perfectly smooth, but not too much texture. Okay, now it's time to draw on the design. I decided to go with a leaf vine type of look. I thought that might be a little bit easier for my first attempt at doing something like this. One thing I will note though, you wanna make sure the pencil marks are light so they can easily be covered up. I pushed a little too hard on my pencil lines and they were pretty dark. This time when I add the design, I wanted it to be a color. So I grabbed my Dixie Belle mud and I put some green paint in it. I did add some food coloring as well, but that was too bright of a green. Now this didn't turn out perfect, but by the end I was getting the technique down and I definitely wanna try this again. To get that petal leaf shape, you wanna squeeze the bag and allow the mud to come out until it's the size you want. Then you drag the bag and the tip down and kind of scrape it to get the rest of the leaf shape. I hope that makes sense. The first side is easy to do. It's the second side that gets tricky when you're trying not to mess up what you already did.
collecting paper towel rolls and vinyl rolls for a while now, waiting for a project to come to mind, and I finally figured out what to do with them. First, I need to get them all to be the same height because the vinyl rolls are at least an inch longer. So I use my miter box to cut them down. Next, I took this lampshade that I had from an old project I made years ago, and I'm gonna start attaching the rolls around the edge of the shade just using hot glue. This is a small seven inch lampshade for reference, and I ended up using 16 rolls six vinyl rolls, and 10 paper towel rolls. Since I didn't have the same number of each type and they did look a little bit different, I added two paper towel rolls, then a vinyl roll as the pattern. However, when I got to the end, I had to do one of each just based on how much room I had. Next, I'm gonna spray paint the entire thing out in the garage. First with the color smoky beige, and then for some texture and dimension, I'm gonna add this stone. I would have liked more of a tan base color, but I didn't have enough spray paint. The different colors in the stone texture would have shown up a little bit better with a different base color. You wanna let the base color dry before adding on that stone texture, I did two coats of both spray paints. And when adding the stone texture, I find it works out better to pulse the nozzle rather than hold it down for a continuous mist. All that's left to do is hang it up. I had this light kit on hand from Ikea. Now, I'm not sure if this is okay for outdoor use, but I only put this outside for the video and then took it back down. We have been getting a lot of rain recently and I didn't want it to get ruined. The rolls are also a little bit uneven, but I didn't want to keep messing around with it. I think it just adds to the character. For this Trash to Treasure project, I'm using an empty hot sauce bottle. I really love the curved shape at the top. I removed the label and for this one, you don't need to worry about getting all of that residue off. I'm turning this one into a paper mache bottle using my cellu clay. This is an instant paper mache and all you need to do is add water until you have a dough-like consistency. Then I just added the mixture onto the bottle. I used a silicone spatula to do this, but you could also just use your hands. You can make it as thick as you want or even alter the shape of the jar just by building the paper mache up in different areas. When I got to the top, I used my fingers more so that I could make sure I didn't lose the shape and then set it aside to dry overnight. Once the paper mache was dry, I'm painting it in the color prairie gray with a sponge dauber. At first I was just gliding the sponge over the surface, not worrying about full coverage on every inch. 
but then I decided I wanted a little bit more coverage of this color. Still not full coverage though. And at last, I took my white wax and added that all over the jar as well. I like how this ended up looking super dimensional and aged. I hope you enjoyed these trash to treasure vases. I still have plenty more trash to treasure ideas on ways you can upcycle items like this. So keep an eye out for another video in the future.